Lesson 16. Uh, we'll, like I said, be able to use Sunday as well to cover the material. And so my aim is to get through Psalm 51 tonight. And, uh, and it kind of right there splits the lesson in half. And we'll look at Psalm 32 and, and 130, Lord willing, on Sunday with some other thoughts as well at the introduction of, of tonight. Um, so the penitential psalms or the songs of the sinner. Um, the most cited psalms of penitence he mentions are Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. And, um, we're most familiar with, I think, Psalm 51 and 32. And we're going to spend the most of our time probably in those two psalms and thinking about the language that's, that's found there. Um, and, and certainly gleaning from it some encouragement about God's forgiveness and, and receiving some information on, on how we're to approach a, a prayer of, of request for forgiveness and acknowledgement of sin. But certainly there are some uh, things to consider in it um, in both of those texts um, from, I guess you might describe a more a doctrinal approach, though, I mean, we're not going to go into any kind of error or anything in, in approaching that. But I think that as fundamental as repentance and forgiveness is, um, it is, I think, taken for granted that we understand the ins and outs of that. And I think in these two psalms, you see um, a lot of information that the Holy Spirit relays to us through David to give us insight into not, not just um, certainly God's part uh, in forgiveness, but then our part in meeting the conditions to receive that forgiveness. And so we're going to talk about some of those things, especially Psalm 59 tonight. And there's some um, certain uh, parallels to the Psalms, obviously, of penitence and songs of the sinner, uh, but there is more emphasis on some points than others in each respective Psalm. And so if we don't cover for example, we'll probably not look at confession as much tonight as we will on Sunday, Lord willing, because Psalm 32 goes into that quite a bit in regard to how heavy sin weighs on us when we don't disclose it to our God and kind of think about why do we need to tell God something he already knows and, and what does that look like in regard to faith and what benefit it might bring us. Um, but I think we're most familiar with Psalm 51 and we'll be able to look at that a little bit. Tonight. But before we get to that, um, he mentioned some specific things in the book at, at the introduction, and uh, there are things I don't think, I, I certainly, growing up, did not always make the connection and didn't always realize what biblical truth lies behind these ideas, um, and, and it's one of those things that it's not always easily identified in the moment, but certainly there is a relation and correlation there that he addresses between physical illness and spiritual illness. And not only does the Old Testament reflect this, but the New Testament does as well. And we don't want to get off on that too much, but I think it's legitimate, especially since he brought it up. And in these psalms of penitence and repentance and songs of the sinner, you're going to see a lot of this language. And oftentimes I think we, we move... Uh, quickly to say this is a metaphorical approach to how this has affected a person's soul. And while that's certainly the case, there may be some literal truth to some of the things that are said. And uh, there's only so far we can take that. But I think it, it, it's more important for us on a personal level to think about how there could be a correlation between our having wronged God and some physical, whether it be malady of the flesh or affliction of the flesh or just adversity uh, with our physical lives. And we know certain sins have very direct consequences. But even when, when we're not seeing that I, I sinned and as a result of that sin, um, you know, I, I got a disease or I got pregnant or I lost my job or I went to prison or whatever it may be. Um, there is the reality of the Lord's chastening, and he works providentially in our lives. And it very well may be that some of the things that we're going through are a result of our sin. And we might not be able to put our finger on it specifically, 
But if we're going through something, it is high time to reflect and make sure we are right with God and we're not bringing this on ourselves. Larry? If it kind of goes with what you're just saying, uh, one of the greatest penitential, uh, it's, it's not exactly a psalm, but it's a prayer is in Jonah. When Jonah is swallowed by the fish and he's praying to God, and it's, if you look at it, it's been written in prose form. And it's, it's, it's very penitential because he's, you know, he's in the fish when he's sick. Yeah, and, and that's something he knows was a result of his sin, not suffering the text. So he says on page 64, it's, Difficult to totally separate physical illness and spiritual anguish and sin. And we'll look at Psalms where the writer clearly understands sin to be his major issue and the cause of his suffering. And then on top of that, I think probably the easiest connection to see between those two is we make ourselves physically sick when we're guilty and we're hiding. And kids know that. Um, and in, when we've upset our parents or when we've obviously upset our father, God, um, and, and we don't deal with that, I mean, stress can destroy a body, and uh, that's certainly a, an obvious connection. So someone read Psalm 6 in verse 2 and 6. Let me just go through some verses in this. Psalm 6, verse 2 and verse 6. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me. For my bones are troubled. My soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. Thank you. So you've got bones being troubled, and that seems to be more metaphorical doesn't it but um, weary with my groaning there's a physical um, response that comes to guilt and a physical weariness uh, look at Psalm 32 and verse 3 when I kept silent my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my vitality was turned into the drought of summer someone read Psalm 38 in verses 3 through 5. Verse 11 says, my loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my relatives stand afar. This gets even more specific and it doesn't just seem metaphorical. Specifically, he talks about his, his wounds being foul and festering because of his foolishness. Maybe um, his, his activity has brought on some kind of physical malady on him. This idea that my loins are full of, of inflammation, it seems to describe that the, the inward pains of the body and some sickness or some um, stress or whatever it may be. And a plague is very detailed as well. Um, so with that in mind, I want us to think about a familiar passage in James chapter 5. Like I said, we won't spend much more time here, but there's some legitimate points to be made. We're not studying James, and this is a passage that there's some debate about in, in regard to some of these things, but I think we'll see an obvious connection. Notice in James 5, he says in verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Pause. Up to this point in the reading, what kind of affliction or sickness is it talking about? It's physical, right? Is anyone suffering? That's not the first time he brought that up. The chapter begins with the oppression of the rich, um, even, even to murder. And then he talks about being patient and establishing your hearts. Don't grumble against um, one another. And then is 
anyone among you suffering? The, the whole book, the whole epistle started with the reality of physical suffering that the brethren were having to endure. They need to count it all joy, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. Up to this point, in anointing him with oil, I believe that's the concept of, of medicine. In the name of the Lord. And so you're praying for someone who is physically sick, and God's going to answer that prayer of the faith. But then he says in verse 15, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And that's when he goes into confess your trespasses to one another. And so there's the if component. He may not have sinned. And it's not just some this generic prayer in, you know, God's going to take care of sins if they happen to be there. But if there are sins, those would specifically have to be dealt with by the person um, in confession. And we'll talk about that in these psalms of, of penitence. But there seems to be a connection there. Here's a person who is sick, and they're, they're applying oil to him. The elders who are righteous men are praying over him. God's answering that prayer and healing him and raising him up. And if it so happens to be that while he's sick, he's also in sin, and they pray for that, God will forgive him as well. And it may be that his sickness was a result of his sin. There's another example in 1 Corinthians 11. You remember when Paul is addressing their divisiveness and especially their um, defiling of the Lord's Supper and observing it as a common meal. He says in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 11, For this reason, because you're not discerning the Lord's body, you're not observing the Lord's Supper, you come together for the worse, you're divided, you're, you're despising the church of God. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many... Sleep. Um, it would seem to me, sleep obviously is a euphemism for death, that if that's spiritual, that though everyone who's involved in this kind of despising of the Lord's body and the church would be dead spiritually. But he's, he's describing very possibly some people who were struggling with and facing physical ailments and maladies as a result of their unfaithfulness. Um, and, and if that doesn't convince you enough of the connection, in Hebrews chapter 12, when he's talking about the chastening of the Lord, he's talking about physical things. He's talking about physical persecution. Um, he's talking about um, physical anguish. Um, and God uses all those kinds of things in our life, even when we are faithful, to mold us to be better fit to serve him. And it very may well be that I brought it on myself. Because I've sinned. And God's wanting me to turn back. And he's using this to bring me back. Does that make sense? That's just kind of a thing that he brought up. That I think that we, we don't often think through. But I think there's some legitimate um, connections to be made. But regardless, guilt will weigh on your conscience, on your soul. To the extent that if you don't deal with it, it will have physical effects to your body. And I think we all um, have felt that. Um, and even if we can't put our thumb on it uh, specifically and make that connection, it's a good time when we're going through those struggles of the flesh to reflect on our spiritual standing and make sure that that's at least taken care of um, and that I'm focused on God. And, and therefore, my prayers for my physical flesh uh, will be heard and answered because I'm right with God. Anyone have comments or questions on that? So he speaks about the value for us today of these psalms. He says, observable in the penitential psalms on page 64 is the great difference between biblical, the biblical model and uh, modern therapies uh, for misbehavior and its consequences. It just so happens that this kind of lines up with what we studied on Sunday in, in our third hour on self-love, because that's really what 
he's alluding to here, modern therapies for misbehavior and its consequences. Um, and so the Bible's model, and it's really not therapeutic, he'd go on to say at the, the end, God's way is the most truly therapeutic means to spiritual and physical recovery and health. There may be cathartic experiences with it. It may have some therapeutic advantages to it, but it's not about it's not about therapy. Um, and there's there's a big difference between the two. So the, what's the problem ultimately when we're talking about you know confessing our sins and the need to be forgiven? All that. What's, what is the main problem? There's, we just talked about some consequences, and those are problems too. But what is the root of this? What is our main concern? Sin. And, and what has it done? Separated from God. Separates us from God, absolutely. Now, modern psychology, that therapeutic approach to it, uh, you notice what he says there, um, therapies for misbehavior and its consequences. The problem that they're trying to address are the consequences of the misbehavior <coughs> The feelings of guilt that come with that, and then the effects of guilt, both mentally, psychologically, and physically, that come with that. And that is the world's main concern. It's not so much, I have sinned, I have wronged God, or I've wronged someone else, but I feel that, and I don't want to feel that. And it doesn't matter what I've done and what's been said to me to make me feel bad, but I, I can't have that bad feeling. That is not what this is about. We don't want that bad feeling, and God wants that bad feeling to be taken away for certain. But that's not the problem. Isaiah 59, sin separates one from God. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. Here's a question, though, and here's the big difference between the two. Can you think of a time when the feeling of guilt can be removed and the sin still remains? Or, or is that possible? Not necessarily can you think of a time. Is it possible that the feeling of guilt is removed, but the sin is still there? Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, scriptures talk about hardening your heart. They talk about searing your heart with a hot, with a hot iron. And that's to become so callous that it no longer bothers you. Yeah. Exactly. First, First Timothy chapter 4 talks about the false teachers who have their conscience seared with a hot iron. And, and they, they know the truth, but they don't believe the truth. They, they know that God has created marriage. They know that God has created this food to be received with thanksgiving. But they're teaching people that it's wrong. And uh, they're corrupting minds. They know the truth, but they don't want to follow it. And they're able to teach what they're teaching because they've seared their conscience, their past feeling. It doesn't, they don't feel guilty in doing it. They don't feel bad in doing it. They're, the sin is there, but they don't feel the sin. Um, they'll feel it in judgment, and that's the problem. We're trying to take care of the actual problem. Um, notice in Isaiah chapter 3, something uh, that is mentioned about the children of Israel. Isaiah 3 and verse 8. It says, Jerusalem stumbled and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Was Sodom ashamed of their sins? No, they had the boldness to go rap on Lot's door and say, you know, bring out the men so that we can know them carnally. There was no shame there. There was excitement about doing those things. They, they were completely unashamed and unabashed before God, he's telling Jerusalem, listen, you're, you're just like Sodom is. You, you know you're in sin, but you don't feel any guilt. You don't feel any remorse. You don't know how to blush. And, and we looked at a passage in Jeremiah on Sunday that talked about that as well. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Did they know how to blush? No, they've forgotten how to blush. And so if you just want to get rid of the feeling of guilt, you want to stop thinking about it. You want to be able to sleep at night. You don't have to go to the Bible. You can go see some modern... Um, therapist and go through some of these things and talk yourself out of it. You can surround yourself with people who think what you did is completely fine and normal and eventually your conscience will be calloused and it's not going to bother you anymore. But your soul will still be dead. And so this is not about getting rid of the feeling of guilt 
and making ourselves feel better in that regard. It's about getting rid of the sin, and the rest is just a byproduct of that. The rest is just an effect of the blessing of forgiveness. And that's extremely important for us to know, lest we convince ourselves through those methods of avoiding the feeling of guilt, whether we're seeking counsel from someone that we know is going to tell us that we're okay, or we just leave a congregation that's standing for the truth to go to a congregation that's not, or uh, we just tune everyone out so that we don't feel bad anymore and we convince ourselves that we're okay because if I wasn't, I wouldn't feel this good, then you know we're going to be in a lot of danger. Um, forgiveness is the key. Yes, sir. There's also a problem with people. It's not a question of clearing their conscience. Their conscience is becoming a shape. There are people who are claiming to be Christians but do not spend a great deal of time studying the Word, and therefore their understanding of God's will is very elementary, yeah. and they haven't gotten themselves to the point where they understand exactly what is sin and yes. what is okay. And, and that's a good point. Same, same result, though. Um, if you sin and, and you don't even know that it's sin, you're not going to feel bad, are you? But you're still separated from God until you come to a knowledge of that so you can rectify it, right? And that's why we're always learning. That's why we're always studying. That's why we're always seeking. Um, and that's why I think we pray the prayer, Lord, if I've sinned and I don't know that I've sinned, please show me. I need to hear that. I need to know um, because you're in the same space. You may not feel bad, but your soul is dead until you get that correct. On the other end of that is, is the person who has at once time uh, had a tender heart and has been touched by the gospel, obeyed the gospel, and then for whatever the reason has built a wall. And so the scriptures talk about that person is worse off than they were before. Yes. Well, the reason why they're worse off than they were before is because of the hardness of their own heart. They've built a wall in that area and they no longer are tender hearted. It's not that they can't be forgiven. It's that unlikely right. without because grief and pain yeah, it's and impossible shame. impossible in the state that they find right. themselves. They, they have already decided that they're not going to be touched. Yes. And so they're, you know, they're the people who, um, you know, they, they were once in the state that Jeff was just describing. And then they came to the knowledge of the sin. And then they turned back anyway. And now they've put that wall up and they've seared their conscience. And the scripture literally says it's impossible to renew them to repentance. It's not saying they can't be forgiven. It's saying that they've rejected everything that they already have heard that would bring them to repentance. So as long as they're in that state, they're not going to be saved. They're not going to, to turn away from their sin. Big difference between they can't be forgiven and they're just not going to be forgiven. Huge difference. Um, all right. And, and to those... To those points, um, you know, we talk about penitence and repentance, and you may find this um, kind of, I guess, technical or it's a matter of semantics or whatever, but penitence is that feeling of sorrow or that, that feeling of guilt, feeling remorseful. Repentance is a change of my will. And so Judas was penitent. In the sense that he was sorry, he, he hated himself, he loathed himself, he, he regretted it, but he did not change his will. He did not turn away from the sin and back to the Lord. Peter was repentant, and uh, we need to be careful because there's been a lot in the church who have um, conflated those two and acted as if penitence is repentance and repentance is penitence, and so as long as you're just sorry— and you ask God to forgive you, that he will forgive you. But in reality, what has to happen is you've changed your will and determined to not do that again. And that's what repentance is. You stop doing that. All right. Psalm 51. We are, are familiar with the psalm. We'll break it down to some degree. Um, So I've got the, I made this outline, um, I was going to think about splitting it into you know, categorically, but it's going to make more sense to just go through it this way. So I want us to notice that the first over half of the psalm is him praying for forgiveness and 
restoration. And in the last half of the psalm, he's really kind of, in his words to God, rededicating himself um, and really making some promises. If you forgive me, if you restore me, if you bring me back to this, then I will do what I want to do, and I'll do better, and I'll do this. And it's not an empty promise, and he's not wagering with God or, or anything like that or, or uh, bartering with God. Um, but certainly it is, it is very appropriate for us to, in our change of will and re renewal of fervor, that we express that to God and that we ask for his strength to do those things that we failed in before. So he prays for forgiveness and restoration first. And I want us to notice in the first four verses that he not only acknowledges his sin, and this is a big part, I think, of it, and we'll talk about that even more in Psalm 32, and he acknowledges his sin, but also a big part of learning about repentance and praying in repentance and penitence for forgiveness before God. What did he do there in verse 1? What did he appeal to? He's praying to God, appealing to God. But what specifically does he mention? Mercy. Mercy. Okay, mercy, have mercy upon me. According to your loving kindness and your, the multitude of your tender mercies, he's appealing to God's nature. He's appealing to God's character. And that's important. Just like in our praise, in our prayers, and we've been hearing a lot of that lately, and I think that this study has helped us, uh, has helped me. Um, we praise God. God is all-powerful. God is almighty, and yet he still has condescended to us in our needs. God is, God is wonderful, and God is good, and God is worthy of our praise. And so all of those praiseworthy things about God, they're praiseworthy because they're, they're also very practical and intimately associated with me. Because when I'm in sin... I depend fully upon those characteristics of God, and it's right for me to bring that to God's attention. What, what are some characters you can think about in the Old Testament, especially, that called on God's character and appealed to God's nature when the nation or a person had sin? Can you think of any off the top of your head? Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of, really. Moses. Um, you can even think about Habakkuk, who he really fully understand God's wisdom in using the Chaldeans to punish Israel, but he talked about how you're of pure eyes then to behold unrighteousness when using a wicked nation to punish his people. You, you're pure, you're holy, you're good, but also you're merciful, you're, you're full of loving kindness and tender mercies, and according to all that, based on all that, please forgive me. And, and that's not, you know, that's not like using it as leverage against God. We shouldn't think of it as that. He still doesn't owe us anything, but that's who he is. And, and he's told us and promised us that I will do this for you because this is who I am. And so it's good for us to appeal to that in our request for forgiveness. Bobby, you got no. All right, so first two verses. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me um, from my sin. And so he appeals to God's loving kindness. It's the Hebrew word hesed, and it's, it's here's what Vine says about it, and it's a very deep word. It's found a lot of times in the Old Testament, but it's a very important word. He says that in the word hesed, there are always three things that are present. Strength, steadfastness, and love. It's often um, translated as steadfast love or loyal love. And it's this love that is associated with God's covenant. And so according to your loyal love, your steadfast love, and it, it's, it's a strength because it's not a mere emotion. It's a, it's a decision, and it's ingrained within God's DNA, so to speak, that he is merciful and he wants to forgive. Um, and he's promised to. He's, he's made a covenant of forgiveness. Notice in uh, Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Verses 34. Really, while you're turning to Exodus 34, you might remember one of the Ten Commandments not making um, an idol. He, he gave the, the reason. I'm, I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy. To thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. That's in 
the covenant. I will show mercy to, to everyone and anyone who is going to um, come, come to me. Chapter 34 of Exodus in verse 5. He's proclaiming the name of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. He doesn't clear the guilty when they don't repent and meet his conditions. He's never going to just sweep sin under the rug. But the reason why we can have sinned in the past and still stand before God without sin is because of his covenant love. And it's the same thing in the new covenant. It's just with the better blood of Christ. The entire old covenant is filled with this fact that God has made a covenant, an agreement um, with these people that though you will sin and you are imperfect, I will forgive you. All the sacrifices point to that. And so this is essentially what David is praying. Listen, because you promised you forgive, that's in your nature to forgive those who want the forgiveness and are willing to turn from their sin. Have mercy on me and forgive me. First John 1 and verse 9 says he's faithful and just to forgive us. And that's the same thing. Confess your sins to him because he's faithful and just to forgive us. He's, he's promised us that. And he has in his wisdom devised a system where he can forgive us based on the perfect blood of Christ. And so uh, appealing to the fact that he has promised and he is faithful to his promise. He's faithful to what he's told us. Based on that, please forgive me. But then what does he say? According to your what? The multitude of your tender mercies. That's just simply compassion. And the two are often combined in Scripture. Um, Lamentations 3, 22. Through the Lord's mercies, Hesed, we are not consumed. That's the word loving kindness. Because his compassions, Raham, that's the word used here, tender mercies, they fail not. And so because you have compassion on me, God, it's not like you're cold-hearted and don't care about me and you'd just rather see me rot away because I wronged you. You actually care about my pitiful state. And because you care, please forgive me. Please take the pain away. Take the guilt away. Uh, make me whole again. Does that make sense? We need to appeal to God's character, his nature, who he is and what he's revealed of himself to us and what he's He's promised to us, and, and that should help us with boldness, shouldn't it? Is there ever anything I could ever do that God cannot forgive me? Obviously, if I don't meet his conditions, I mean, is there something I can do that's so bad that God will not forgive me? What did David do? What is this psalm about? I neglected to, I know we know what it's about, but I neglected to look at the superscription. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. If you don't ask, if you don't want it, if you don't meet his conditions, he's not going to be able to forgive that. Um, because it's he's faithful and just, and he's faithful and just because there's a very key component, the blood of Christ. It's the only thing that can wash sins away, and, and there's conditions to meet that. It was, it was David's sin with Bathsheba, right? The murder of Uriah the Hittite. Nathan came and said, you are the man. You convicted him of, of his sin. And David still was able to have the boldness to write this psalm. Um, and it's because of not, not who we are and what we're owed or, or our ability in words, but it's in who, who God is. It's also important, and he mentions this in the book, to uh, think about um, what sin is. He says, blot out my transgressions. What are transgressions? The book kind of mentions it in parentheses. You've gone beyond God's law. So here is a law, and you have broken that law. That's, that's in the record book. Revelation 20 says, books will be opened, will be judged by the things that are written in them. What we are doing is being recorded, and we will be judged by them. So in that ledger God has, and obviously that's figurative language, he has recorded all of my sins, and they will be looked at in specificity at the judgment. So... What can I have confidence in that nothing will be there in the judgment? 
blot out my transgression. Erase them is what he's saying. Just erase them. And he's got an eraser. And he's able to do that. Wash me and cleanse me. What does that say? So you got more kind of the legal aspect that a transgression of a law. You need to just erase that. That's not, we expunged your record is the way we would say it uh, today. He's expunged our record. But that's more kind of a legal thing. What does wash and cleanse kind of bring to our attention in regard to sin? Yeah, it's not, it's not just a technical offense, right? There's something more serious uh, about this. Um, and so I think Kurt alluded to it earlier. Um, he didn't say the specific passage, but this, this idea of turning back to your sin when you know the truth in the latter end is worse than the beginning. Second Peter 2 talks about a dog returning to his vomit or a sow having washed or wallowing in the mire. Now, you're returning to that. But even before you ever got out of it, that's where you are. Vomit and mire. And so it's it's more than just, okay, yeah, technically I missed the mark. I missed my aim. No, you're filthy and disgusting and abhorrent to God. That's what sin does to you. So wash me thoroughly, he even says. Um, he says, I've acknowledged my transgressions, verse 3. My sin is always before you and against you, and you only have I sinned. And done this evil in your sight that you may be found um, just when you speak and blameless when you judge. There was more on the front end of this than the latter end. So just, just to explain myself, and we will finish this next Sunday and get into Psalm 32. But question number two says, how would you explain the fact that David declares his sins, including adultery and murder, to be against God as opposed to against Uriah or other humans injured by his actions? What do you learn about sin from this? All sins against God. Absolutely. Whether it involves other people or not, but certainly it doesn't need to do that. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think the one that you said such a sin against his son. Yes. It would be a better term because he, he made the rule. Yeah. It's he he's the one that defined it. Yeah. Right? It, even if the person didn't want you to do it to them, that's not what made it wrong. And that's not what made it bad. It's because God said. You shall not do it. Did I hear something over here? Yeah. Uh, also, when, uh, when you do something when you're involved, when you're like motivating people or something like that, or affecting somebody, your chances of letting go go down. You know? So God's the only one that can offer us forgiveness of this, too. So, you know, you have to know that to get a chance of being forgiven and then to keep that forgiveness as well. And if we don't have that, and, and no one's going to forgive us, then we, you know, not, there's nothing better to offer. that end, if, if uh, I've done something wrong to Carl, and you know he confronts me about that, and I feel really bad because me and him are really close, so I make it right with him, but I didn't really even think about the fact that I sinned against my God. Has that, re it's prepared our relationship, maybe, but has it done anything for me spiritually? Uh, he says that leave your, leave your gift to the altar, at the altar and go and make your um, problem right with your brother. That's certainly true. That's a condition, though, of forgiveness from God as well, so that I can come to God with my gift um, to the altar. Todd? I mean, we can seek forgiveness from our brothers or, or people that we sin against, but if we don't get forgiveness unto salvation, it's going to be to God. It doesn't matter yes. how many people in the world that we've wronged that have all forgiven us. Yeah. I mean, they may give us peace of mind. responsibility we have sir, to make it right with them, but that's an effort we make. It's up to them whether they're going to forgive us, and that will be between them and God, like in the model prayer. Forgive us as we forgive others. But that's not, that's a, a 
a step in the condition to be forgiven by God. And that's an excellent point, because if you gauge where you are spiritually simply by, you know, because you could have done something wrong, you're not really sorry about it, so you came forward and you, you said, hey, congregation, I did this, that, and the other, or if I've sinned or if I've wronged, he kind of mentions those phrases, please forgive me, and everyone hugs you, and you, you cry, and you go home, but really, you did not repent, you never prayed to God, that, I mean, you're not forgiven, not from God, and that's the main thing, that's the whole problem that we're addressing here.